Hello and welcome to The Conversation. I'm Shannon Taylor, the Executive Director of Blacks and Jews in Conversation. Our guest today is Rhonda Barad, who is the chairperson, I will call her, of the East Coast side of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And her credits are quite extensive. Serving as the Eastern Director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which is an international human rights organization, just like us, but a far larger entity, which gives her far more scope and duties and responsibilities and working far harder than even me, committed to confronting racism, violence, and Jew hatred around the world, to fostering tolerance through Holocaust education. She opened the center's New York office back in 1981. We only go back until 1993. And three years after founding it uh, in Los Angeles, where it was uh, Simon Wiesenthal's uh, office under Rabbi Heyer. Rabbi Heyer, I understand, uh, was uh, uh, the rabbi for Rhonda in Vancouver. They're both uh, Canadian. And uh, I happen to love Canada, having gone from one coast to the other, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, I should have spent more of my life over there. I would have been a happier person. There's plenty of wilderness and plenty of open spaces and all of what America has been losing over the years. As director of the largest satellite office, she's overseen its expansion on all levels and is the liaison to government agencies, both local, state, and federal. She oversaw the opening of the New York Tolerance Center in 2006, which is a project of the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles of international reputation. Prior to joining the Simon Wiesenthal Center, she was assistant to the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. She's a graduate of Stern College for Women of Yeshiva University and completed her master's at New York University's Wagner School of Public Administration in Nonprofit Management. We could use her here in Nonprofit Management. Blacks and Jews in Conversation is nonprofit, as is not just Blacks and Jews in Conversation. Rhonda, we need some nonprofit management so we can grow to be as large as your organization. She is on the board of directors of the Brain Tumor Foundation, and perhaps you could tell us something about that. She's lived in New York since 1973. She is a uh, a student of our dear friend Malcolm Hohenlein. Welcome to uh, the conversation, Rhonda. And uh, please, please begin by telling us how it has been since 1981 growing the Center of Tolerance in New York City. It's been quite incredible. You just went through my entire resume. It made me feel very old and very tired. Um, if I can digress a little bit, working with Rabbi Heyer, who uh, sought me out when I was 15. I was president of the youth group at the synagogue in Vancouver, and he told me what I was going to do for a living. And he told me, um, after I started working for Malcolm Holmline in 1976, that I would be working for him within five years. The Wiesenthal Center didn't exist at that time, and I thought he was um, a little touched, because I knew I wasn't going back to Vancouver, and lo and behold, in uh, January of 1981, he was in New York, and he offered me the job to open the New York office. It's been an incredible run. I've watched the center grow from a tiny microcosm to be an international human rights organization with 400,000 families who are members of the center throughout North America. And the center in New York grew from a two-room office with myself, a secretary, and some volunteers to my office on 42nd Street and the New York Tolerance Center, also down the block on 42nd Street. And, um, but I think that one of the, the programs that really resonates with me the most is the one I was hired to promote, which was um, the beginnings of our documentary film company called Genocide. The center hired me to promote our very first film, which was uh, produced in 1981 and won Best Documentary Feature in 1982. It was called Genocide, and it was narrated by Elizabeth Taylor and Orson Welles. And Rabbi Heyer was a very brilliant man. Um, he saw, I believe, through some of Mr. Wiesenthal's guidance, of a way to grow a new organization in, from California, which had the fastest growing Jewish population at the time, was Los Angeles, into the organization that we are today. He, uh, at the time, there were three things going on. There was the movement in Germany to abolish the statute of limitations against the prosecution of Nazi war criminals. The revisionist historians were really, really rearing their ugly head 
from the Midwest at uh, Northwestern University out to California proclaiming the Holocaust was a hoax, that the ovens were there to bake bread and the gas chambers were there to kill lice. And it gave us an opportunity. Also, in 1976, a Holocaust, the miniseries, was on TV. And I think at that time, before that time, the American, Canadian, world population wasn't ready to really deal with the Holocaust um, as a historic watershed event. And that gave us the opportunity to make this first movie called Genocide. And we did it as a documentary. And it's gone on to being broadcast around the world. It was shown on national Chinese television about 12 years ago. It's been translated to many languages. And it was our first of our 10th, 10 films that we have. And we have two Academy Awards to our credit, the second being The Long Way Home from 1998. And I think I need to take a breath. I remember that film quite well. I was. Uh, uh introduced uh, to the Simon Maguizi Film Center, and it was a, a pivotal film. It was shown to us at Cooney, uh, and they had the dearth of Holocaust material. My father was in the resistance. He had spent the better part of his time here in America after the war trying to talk about the Holocaust. Nobody wanted to listen. And uh, Simon Wiesenthal's history bear some note to our, to our public. I'm sure that many of them have not seen the movie about his life and are not familiar with his record. And uh, we have the movie The Fines is out now, and of course Tom Cruise's movie Valkyrie, and, and you have movies about resistance to Hitler both within and without, uh, by, by people in camps, out of camps, as in Defiance by uh, director Ed Zwick, and, and even in the Nazi circles after D-Day, with the generals, uh, at any move you made against Hitler, you, you were certain to, to, to lose your life through torture if you were caught and you failed. So perhaps start us off now with a little bit about Simon Wiesenthal. Well, for those in your audience who don't know who Mr. Wiesenthal is, was, he was a, um, a Jew who grew up and was born in Buchach, which was Poland, is now uh, the Ukraine. He was an architect by profession, and after the war, when he was liberated, he didn't want to go back to being an architect. He said, you can't build homes for dead people, and uh, went to work for the Americans in the camps, and started keeping records and taking notes. He had kept meticulous notes when he was in camp, and he was able to, uh, from memory, put them to paper. And he helped the Americans uh, gather some of the information for the Nuremberg trials. Mr. Wiesenthal was a one-man show for many, many years. And he um, caught the attention of a gentleman named Katz in New York who was in Tokyo. And Simon was going to close his office. And Katz said to, called him and said, keep your office open. We'll have dinner in two days. He flew to Vienna. And he funded Mr. Wiesenthal's office through the Jewish Documentation Center. That was in the mid-50s, early 60s. The Wiesenthal Center um, was not created till 1976. And that was when uh, Rabbi Heyer went to see him to get his most precious possession, his name. And Simon was very adamant that he would give us his name only and only if we started an action-oriented organization and not an organization that collects documents and takes them out as, he said, out of the freezer once a year and occasionally the material gets buried. It needed to be used, it needed to be dealt with, and we needed to speak out against not only the incidents against the Jews, as Mr. Wiesenthal did throughout his life. He spoke out against Bosnia and Rwanda and Cambodia. When I first met him, he was at the United Nations dealing with the Cambodian issues. And um, he did not live to speak out against Darfur. And as a result of our last movie, I've Never Forgotten You, um, that you touched upon, Shannon, we started a new group called Generations Against Genocide, which is our younger group founded by children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors to uh, keep Simon's flame alive and speaking out against other groups. That is, is, is fascinating. I, um, I did an event with Beth Kalinsky of Jewish Action Alliance and others uh, following in the footsteps of the Village uh, Voice. Uh, they had uh, authors there. It was in the um, early 90s uh, in the courts with uh, uh, 60 judges and attorneys against uh, the Sudan and the exiling of sheikhs from the Sudan, some in particular. 
It was the first such event in New York City protesting what was going on in Sudan and uh, made all the media and it was dropped. No, nobody took it up at, at that immediate point. Later on with the Conference of Presidents on the Malcolm, all of a sudden people came from Baltimore and said, look, we want to raise money and keep the momentum going. It was years, years later. I suggested who we had had and involved at that time was the Black Bar Association, it, it was groups such as yours, it, it was uh, everybody would come to that, uh, that initial uh, desk pounding meeting and of course it had been told that uh, the terrorist groups to train in the Sudan, that this was the fertile ground where all the terrorists had come out of and so everybody's, everybody's uh, cause is, is where everybody is getting persecuted, that you can't just let them alone, it will eventually catch up to everyone. And, and, and I'd like to hear about the film you have now, um, uh, Mariah film, I believe it's called Against the Tide, and, and that it concerns the, internation, the internal struggle here in America between such as Stephen Wise representing one camp of Roosevelt cooperatives and the other such as uh, Stephen Bergson saying we must go out and actively rescue those in, uh, uh, facing genocide in Europe. Uh, yes, we're premiering the film in New York Tuesday evening at the Screwball Theater at NYU. And um, it's our 10th Mariah film. And yes, it is about Peter Bergson uh, primarily in what he did, but it, it's more global. It's about the lack of world and American response to the Shoah and what was going on over in Europe and the fact that the Western countries closed their borders more than anything. And Peter Bergson's story is one that a lot of people don't know. And we have uh, many people on camera who worked with Peter Bergson, who fought to get in, some people who did work with Stephen Wise. And I don't want to give away the story, but there are still tickets available, and anybody watching the show can call my office and or call NYU and uh, book tickets to come Tuesday evening at the Skirball Theater. It's narrated by Dustin Hoffman. Most of our films are narrated by uh, major Hollywood actors and actresses. And uh, this one is hopefully going to make uh, its mark in um, our community on college campuses and open the eyes of the communities to something that they probably don't know about. Well, do you want me to give away the story or talk some about it? Or would no. you rather I keep quiet? I think you could keep quiet. How about this? I'll come back and we'll talk about the movie after the premiere. We don't want to ruin uh, what everybody's going to see because I know that your audience can't wait to call my office and buy tickets. All right, I'll keep quiet. I'll follow, I'll follow your lead, and I, even though my tongue is, is desperate to come out of my mouth on this subject because it's really mouth-watering. This, this is the stuff, this is the stuff that, that makes for all of history. This, this is the, the gristmill of, 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 of what went on through the 30s and 40s and has left legacies on all sides. But I'll be quiet. I won't go. I won't, I'll keep my mouth still and hopefully everybody will go and form their own judgments and then we can hash it out here. So let's proceed on further and tell me about your Tolerance Center in New York City. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it. Um, the Tolerance Center, as you indicated earlier, is the, an adjunct of the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. And about eight or nine years ago, um, I've been in as you mentioned, we opened the office in New York in 1981, and we were in the schools. We would reach three quarters of a million students every year um, through our films and our speakers and through the materials that we provided to the public, private, and parochial schools. We could only go so far, and I was always of the mind that if we were going to open any type of a facility in New York, it had to be unique, and it had to be something that no other organization, especially Jewish organization, was doing in the city. We created a program in Los Angeles at the Museum of Tolerance after the LA riots called Tools for Tolerance. Tools for Tolerance is a professional development training program originally for law enforcement, then teachers, and all frontline professionals, and now we've gone on to teenagers with a full day training program. So that's what we decided to bring to New York. And given the fact that we were going to be training the public, um, the powers that be in the institution and some of our consultants said, you must go for public money. So we went to the state and Shelley Silver, our esteemed speaker of the uh, state assembly, happened to have gone to school with my boss on the Lower East Side to um, correct you, Shannon. Rabbi Har was born on the Lower East Side and then moved to Vancouver. Shelley flew out to California, saw what we were doing, and gave us the seed money um, 
to start construction and raise the money for the project. Midway, um, we decided to expand and put in a theater, so the budget doubled. And we were ready to start construction on September 15, 2001. Needless to say, we didn't, and um, we didn't start construction until January of 2003. And as you indicated, we started training in 2006. And it's a very busy place. Uh, we have an experiment going on. We're open to the public on certain days because of the configuration of this space. Um, you really need to come when you have two two hours to spend, and Martin Luther King Day is our next public day. And if, you're, if your audience is interested to go visiting the, visit the Tolland Center, you can call 212-697-1180 and book time to come in, bring your fan, friends, family. I would recommend that if you are going to do a tour, come with a few of your friends, because a tour is much better when you can bounce the questions that you're going to have in your comments as you're walking through the exhibitions. What is your website? www.wiesenthal.com, and that's W-I-E-S-E-N-T-H-A-L.com. Now, our organization for many, many years uh, has always comprised uh, itself of, of more than one uh, ethnicity for an event. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we're going to a university, we bring judges uh, who are both black and Jewish, or Hispanic mm -hmm. and black, or, or uh, Asian and Jewish, or, or, or some such thing. It's rare that we will address something uh, from a purely, uh, you know, Jewish panel. Even though in Holocaust we bring f a panoply of, of people, because we're addressing a crowd or an audience that's mixed in, the, in, in a school. In Stuyvesant High School next week, we are, we're doing uh, gay and lesbian and bisexual marriages part two with an entertainment panel, uh, father-daughter kind of a mixture, uh, Wednesday, open to the public. Uh, and again, we bring a, a mixture on the panel. We had an interfaith program uh, and, and a, a biracial marriage with all points of view represented. We have a mixed panel. Your center, I believe, has the same perspective, that it is geared, as you've mentioned, to all groups all backgrounds coming in and viewing all histories. Am I correct? You're absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, the Jewish community doesn't use us as much as I would like them to. We are pri primarily um, the minorities. I mean, if you think about the who makes up the police department and the corrections department and who goes to our public schools and who teaches our kids, it is multi-ethnic and multiracial. Um, we are working with the Jewish community, but it's a harder audience to crack because, you know, we don't think that we need a lot of education and we all get along. But um, it's, we're working and bringing together um, different groups. As a matter of fact, next uh, Wednesday on the 14th, we're doing a special program with three schools, one public school from New York, one Jewish private school, and a Catholic school together for a special Martin Luther King Day program. And we have a council, the councilman from Harlem is going to be the Lunch with a Living Legend. Last year we had Bill Thompson, our controller, and the first year we had Caroline Goodman, whose son Andrew Goodman was killed in Mississippi. He was one of the Freedom Riders in 1963. Well, there's the parody uh, right as you speak. Uh, uh, Bill Thompson has done a program with his father, our chairman, uh, Bill Thompson Sr. at, Tom, at uh, Stuyvesant Forest for the, for the holidays, and has done, as president of Board of Ed, has done a program with us at, at uh, 360 Adams Street, the Supreme Court in Brooklyn in years past. And uh, the, ca the council we always draw upon, all, all the different speakers, because that's, that's the public official. You know, we want our public officials to be with the students and with us and, and uh, doffing the robes and, and letting everybody get to know one another face to face. To face. And as far, as, far as, as the mix of public, we believe that a subject like the Holocaust is not something that is Jewish property. It's something that is meant for public consumption because it was not Jews who did it to Jews, it, 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 and it is not something that just happened to Jews, and it is, it is an ongoing thing. Uh, you share that philosophy, obviously. We do. I mean, the Holocaust is a stepping stone for everything that the center stands for. It was the greatest watershed event where one nation was targeted for complete annihilation. And I would like to think that if we use those lessons today, that we might learn something. Unfortunately, I don't think we're, are, we're not 
great students. And as we turn around every, every decade, there is some other genocide going um, around. We were unique. Um, we lost more people. But I still think that those, re those lessons definitely resonate today. And I think that young people have to know about that the Holocaust did happen. And um, it is the most documented of um, such occurrences in the last 100 years. We keep very good records, and the Nazis helped us. They kept even better records. When, when people are Holocaust deniers, they obviously w want to do the Holocaust again. There's no purpose in denying that the Holocaust existed except to prepare the route for another Holocaust, as, w as with Iran. What, what measures or steps do you, uh, have you taken to face off the Holocaust deniers? Education. We educate young people. I mean, as Simon always said, you know, he has a quote. He said, you know, you can't eat all day, you can't hate all day. You have to stop. My philosophy is I'm an eternal optimist, and I think that if we get our young people today from every walk of life and educate them now, we will cut them off, and we won't have the haters tomorrow. Now, can we do it all together at one time? No but one student at a time, and um, that is one of the, um, the pillars that Judaism stands for. Is, um, but we can do it. I, am re I really believe it, and um, I think young people are now more open to it. And I'd like to think that um, the next generation, not everybody's going to want to work on Wall Street, and we'll have another round of teachers and nurses from every ethnic group and that we're all going to expand our interests as well and that people should go into public education and private education. We have a dear mutual friend in Mel Parnes uh, who was uh, of course the uh, President Emeritus of B'nai Zion and uh, he was kind enough to, uh, to, to escort me to the City Council the other night when you received a, a, a handsome award uh, together with uh, distinguished district attorney uh, uh, Robert Morgenthau uh, and, uh, uh, and another gentleman who was formerly from NYU uh, Medical. And I didn't know him uh, at that time or when I was hospitalized every year. I certainly would have taken advantage of him. And uh, I, I would like to know every time somebody is taken to Israel, uh, they, they, besides uh, being greeted by, by the uh, government, they go to Yad Vashem. And uh, it's like the city council of Israel, Yad Vashem. Uh, is there a Simon Wiesenthal Center in Israel? Are there relations between Yad Vashem and the Simon Wiesenthal Center? And if not, uh, what are the plans for the future? Well, um, our relationship with Yad Vashem are excellent. We just published a piece in uh, Mr. Wiesenthal's memory together that was released on the anniversary of Mr. Wiesenthal's birth. He would have been 100 years old, December 31st this year. And uh, we are, we do have plans um, to build a museum in Israel, the Museum of Tolerance. It will not deal with the Holocaust, of course, because Israel does have Yad Vashem. And uh, we, the courts just ruled that we were able to build. Um, I don't believe we'll be building for at least another year. The world economy is such, we still have a lot of money to raise. And um, our plan is to really push through construction beginning in another year. Hopefully things will um, the economic climate will be in a better place for us. But we have been stopped by a, um, a court filing from Hamas when they won the election in Israel to keep us from building. So there is a plan, but I've always believed that everything happens for a reason, and the museum will be what it's supposed to be when it is built. Now, all right. Uh, I understand that you have relatives that were among those who were saved in the uh, Belsky situation. That's the subject of the Defiance movie. Uh, if, uh, if not, uh, I understand that uh, you certainly had a premiere of it in, in Los Angeles. And of course, the movie is dear to my heart, as I've said, because it is the first such major motion picture about people like my father, who spent most of the war years rescuing Jews. Uh, he, my father did it with regard to children kidnapped by Klaus Barbie or or threatened by Klaus Barbie, and uh, the Belskis did it with some 1,200 Jews in the villages of, of Poland. Would you uh, talk something about that? Well, I haven't seen the movie. I'm going to see it, as I indicated to you earlier, um, Saturday night. 
However, um, I have some distant relatives through marriage who were with the Bielskis, but a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine, her mother was Bielski. And I know uh, quite a few people who were part of the partisan movement and with the Bielskis who were very close friends of my family. We hosted the Los Angeles premiere of Defiance at the Museum of Tolerance. We have a state-of-the-art, absolutely drop-dead, gorgeous theater in the museum, and it was just completed. So we were honored that they wanted to premiere the movie uh, at the Museum of Tolerance in L.A. But I can't really comment on I've read the book. Nechama Tech, who wrote it, used to speak for me in the schools when she was younger and spryer and getting out when we first opened in New York office. But um, I can't comment on the movie since I haven't seen it, although I will comment that I do like Daniel Craig, so I am looking forward to seeing it. Well, it's not and Lady Shabbers, nothing to, nothing to sneeze at either. It's not every day you have the leading actors of Broadway and film, and James Bond, uh, coming in to uh, represent Jews on, 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 the, on the leading, uh, leading scene of, of partisans. And uh, I didn't think I'd ever see today. Uh, we have two minutes left. Give us your thoughts on Tom Cruise fighting Adolf Hitler and Daniel Craig representing the partisans and, and movies on public television about the lost, stolen art of the Jews and the, uh, what was just on about from, from Hitler to Hollywood, all the great uh, directors that came over here. Are, are we being saturated or are we seeing justice done by film? Well, if I can comment, I mean, I'm a big documentary person, so if I can address the one from Hitler to Hollywood, I did see that, and I thought it was an excellent piece. Um, I think that the fact that some of our greatest directors escaped Nazi Europe to make some of the best films that we have in our archives that are Hollywood movies. I mean, Billy Wilder, for one, made some of the best movies out there, and I think that that's very important. As far as the Hollywood movies, is it important? Yes. Saturation? As long as people are buying tickets to go to the movies, I guess it's not saturated. But I would, if I could comment on one other thing, that um, in case your audience doesn't know, that um, we know we're fighting a war in Israel right now, and there's a big rally on Sunday at 2.30 near the Israeli consulate. And I think everybody needs to know, and we all need to get out there, because it's very important. Uh, we used to rally during Soviet jury days. And as I told you earlier, I cut my teeth on the Soviet jury movement, and I think it's very important that we stand up and have our voices known because other people are having their voices known as well. So the rally is at 2.30 on Sunday, and I'm sure there'll be ads in the papers, and it'll be all over the radio. So we all have to be out there and um, scream, yell, and show our true colors. Because um, Sunday, 2.30, outside the Israeli consulate at 42nd and 2nd, and I think it's, um, it's very, very important. You know, we always need a homeland to go to, and we didn't have one during the Shoah to bring you back to our, originally, our original comments. And I think that um, I love Israel, and I think it's just a great, great place. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. I look forward to your next appearance. And I might add, I didn't even have to ask for that last comment or mention uh, the, the rally over the war going on. Obviously, uh, your neshama is so strong for Jews in Israel, you couldn't contain it anymore. And that's the kind of guest we love here. Thank and you. And I wanted it as my, my outgoing comment. Thank you. Thank you.